you as well? Perfectly. How are you doing all? Not too bad, I think. Check. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. Perfect. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. So thank you very much, Nicola, for joining us. Um, yeah, so our next talk will be given by Nicola. Nicola is an assistant professor at EPFL. And he's going to talk about the role of stochasticity in learning algorithms. Uh, Nicola, take it away. Cool. Can you see the pointer? Yes? Perfect. Yes. Okay, thanks so much for the invitation. And you know, I'm really sorry not to be able to be with you today. And the I mean, the lineup of the workshop really looks like amazing. So, congrats. So, I'm super happy to talk to you about like, this uh, recent light of work we have done about the role of stochasticity in learning algorithm. So, it's mainly, you know, thanks to my like, amazing collaborators, so Scott, who is a PhD student with me, Lucas, who was a postdoc with me, and Julien, who is a researcher at uh, Econ Normal. Uh, Pont et Chaussée, like the National des Ponts et in Paris. Okay, and really like all the projects, you know, start some time ago when uh, Natis Rebo went uh, on a sabbatical at EPFL. And so we were like uh, brainstorming a bit, like among different professors in theory of machine learning. And at one point he, he raises like an open problem to see if it would be possible to find a framework where it could be I mean, where it could be possible to theoretically characterize the difference of generalization between stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent. Okay. And at that time, for me, it was super striking because, you know, I come from a convex uh, optimization background. And I always seen HGD as just as like an efficient algorithm to get, you know, to the same point, to get to the same performance on gradient descent. But then at that point, we realized that, in fact, when you have like a non-convex landscape, the noise can, you know, can drive you to some good area of uh, the loss and can, in fact, lead to better generalization properties. And that's really what we will try to study today. And that's something which has been you know, fairly well um, observed empirically. So you have a lot of paper, which, is, I mean, which are explaining that, in practice, when you want to train a neural network, you will get to better solution if you are using a small batch, okay? So, putting in another way, it would be super difficult to train a neural network with a large batch or with full mm -hmm. gradient descent. And that's something which is not well understood theoretically. You had like some, you know, some first work on it, but it was always in the case of gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent with label noise. So it's not, not exactly the noise of gradient descent. It was like more like you are like, artificially adding some noise into your data, and then you try to see how it modifies the dynamics. And so today we will really consider stochastic gradient descent, and if there's only one thing to remember from this talk, it will be this plot. So what we will see is that it exists one framework, namely it would be a sparse linear regression problem, from which it's possible to show that on a particular parameterization of this framework, it would be a non-convex parameterization, the performance of stochastic gradient descent will be of one order of magnitude better in terms of generalization than the performance of gradient descent. Okay? So that's what we will try to study today. Is it clear? Very much Good. so. Okay. And so, you know, let's start by a quick introduction. So what, you know, what are we doing? It's really like a classical machine learning setup. So we have an observation, x, i, y, i, which are ideal according to some unknown law you don't know how. And what you want is that you will have some prediction function at w of x, okay? So y will be close to f of w of x, and the aim of the goal is to find w star, which will minimize your true risk. Okay, what is the true risk? It is the expectation under the unknown distribution row of some log function between your uh, prediction at W of X and your label one. And today we are considering some regression problems, so it will be, uh, the loss will be the quadratic loss, okay, X squared. And you have different examples, so you can consider some linear prediction, so your prediction will be equal to W transpose X, and you can also 
consider some neural network. So where your prediction function will be a nonlinear uh, function of your observation x, but still parameter high by some parameter w. And since the distribution how is unknown as classically in machine learning, you know how you can find a good estimator of the value star is by minimizing the empirical risk. So by minimizing the sum of your loss, not over the true distribution, but over the empirical distribution. Okay, so you are minimizing the average of your loss among your data. But then what is super important to have in mind in that particular setting is that we are in the over parameterized setting. So the number of parameters, the dimension n is really larger than the number of, of observation n. Okay, d is larger than n. And d larger than n means that it will exist a lot of different parameters of value so that you have an exact match. Okay, so that f of w star of x i is equal to y i. Okay, so it exists a lot of different parameters. And the main question will be to understand to which particular solution, to which particular w star, which is minimizing the empirical risk, we are converging to. And so we will consider two different algorithms, the gradient descent algorithm and the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Okay, so these are optimization algorithms to minimize your empirical loss. And gradient descent, you know, I mean, I think you all know this, it's the algorithm which will follow the negative gradient direction at each step. And the stochastic gradient descent algorithm will be the algorithm which will follow an estimate of your true gradient. And in order to build this estimate, you are just sampling uniformly one observation between one and n, and you just follow the gradient of the loss evaluated in this observation. And as I already told you, when we were in a classical convex setting, for example, for linear prediction, then often the goal is to show that gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent converge to the same point, okay? But now in this non-convex setting, okay, so for example, when we are considering that the prediction is a neural net, Stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent can converge to different solutions. And in fact, what we'll be able to prove is that the noise in HDD will help you to converge to a different solution, which will have some better generalization property. And the way to characterize where the solution of the algorithm is converging, it is what is referred as the implicit bias. We will quickly define now. So what are the motivation behind the uh, implicit bias concept? You know, is that we know that in practice, neural networks which are over parameterized, so with more parameters than observation, generalize super well. Whereas you have a lot of different solutions which will exactly fit the data. And they are generalizing well, even if we are using very little regularization, or even sometimes no regularization. And so the main question is to understand why we still obtain this impressive generalization property and one of the ideas, one of the ways to understand such phenomenon is, you know, to understand the implicit bias of the algorithm, which is this idea that, you know, the training algorithm you are using, GD, GD, Adam, everything, is not picking any solution, any minimizer of the training loss, but in fact will pick one particular solution which will have some good property, okay? And what we are trying to do when we are studying the implicit bias of an algorithm is to exactly characterize what are these properties of the solution picked by the algorithm we are using. Okay, and the second idea we will investigate today is that in fact, stochasticity in the algorithm will play a fundamental role in this phenomenon and in fact will help to, in some sense, uh, emphasize this good property. So, in order to characterize the implicit bias of the algorithm, we will uh, use some, <coughs> some norms. Okay, so let me define this. We still have our empirical error, L of W, which we are minimizing either with gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And so we can denote by W infinity the limit of our optimization algorithm. Okay, so the iterate WT will converge to W infinity. And even if both algorithms, SGD and GD, will converge to a minimizer of the training loss, which corresponds to an interpolator of the data, what we want to characterize is what are the properties 
of this particular solution W infinity. Okay. And in order to get a final description of this solution peak by this algorithm, what we will use is that we will use a concept of minimum norm interpolation. So we will say that W infinity is a minimizer of some auxiliary problem. So it will be the minimizer of some function, some criteria R, and it will be the minimizer of this criteria R over the set of the minimum of the function N. Okay? So your algorithm is not converging to any solution, to any minimizer of the train loss, but it will converge to one particular one and to the one which corresponds to the minimum R solution. And you can think of as a criteria R as, for example, some norm, the L1 norm or the L2 norm. Okay? So if your algorithm will be implicitly, implicitly biased through the L1 norm, it will mean that, in fact, the solution picked by the algorithm will be the minimum L1 norm interpolators. And if your algorithm is implicitly biased through the L2 norm, then the solution, your algorithm will converge to the minimum L2 norm interpolator solution. Okay. So this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to characterize for a particular algorithm what would be the corresponding R. And you know you have to keep this in mind that it's really in contrast with explicit regularization, which we can also do, is that you could also directly add to your um, optimization objective, you could explicitly add the regularization R so that you will explicitly be uh, biased through this regularization. But today what we are considering is like implicitly biased. So we will be biased through uh, R without, you know, without adding it to the algorithm. And maybe one of the simplest examples of implicit bias is the case of the least square. So when you are doing a regression with a linear predictor, and in that case, you directly see that both the iterate of gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent have a very nice property, which is that they belong to the span of the observation x1 to xn. Okay. And using this, and using the fact that WT will converge to the solution, you can directly show that, in fact, for a linear prediction, the iterate of the algorithm, both gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, will converge to the minimum L2 norm interpolator. Okay. I don't have a lot of time today, so I won't be detail the proof, but this is a super simple proof. And the main uh, takeaway of this is that if you have a linear, linear predictor, you are biased through the L2 norm geometry, and both gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent have the same implicit bias. Okay, and this idea of implicit bias has been studied in a lot of different papers for a lot of different models for classification, for regression, for linear and nonlinear predictors. We had a lot of, I mean, intensive work on this. But the idea of stochasticity has been uh, a bit uh, forgotten. And so, since for linear model and convex problem, it was not possible to distinguish between gradient descent and, gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. What we are doing is that we will move to a bit more complicated model, but still super simple, which are uh, diagonal linear network of depth two. So what we are considering is that we are considering a diagonal linear network of depth two, which is explained here. And this is really equivalent to consider a linear parametrization, but instead of having this, you know, weight beta, I will parameterize beta as u times v, okay? Where this Adamar product is just like the product component of So instead of looking for a beta, of a beta, so that your prediction will be beta times x, you will be looking for two vectors, u and v, and your prediction will be equal to x, a scalar product with u times v, okay? And so the problem is equivalent to minimizing this function over W, which is a parameter U and V. So this problem over U and V of this square loss, but, param I mean, but of your prediction parameterized by this U uh, multiplied with V. And what is super important to have in mind is that no, this problem in U and V is non-convex. 
which is the convex problem in the prediction function beta. But when you look into the, this problem in uh, the parametrization, u and v, it's becoming a non-convex problem. And so even if the class of function you know you can uh, generate is still the same, it will be a different dynamics when you will minimize this function using gradient descent or gradient flow on new NV. And in order to study the implicit bias of a gradient algorithm on this particular example, we will consider the gradient flow, which is the infinitely step size limit of the gradient descent algorithm. And so mainly the main result we have in that case. Okay. Which has been shown by uh, Natis Rebro and Bothers in this paper in 2020, is that when you are doing a gradient flow of this loss with this parametrization, so here it's just for simplicity, it's not anymore u times v, but it will just be w squared. It's exactly, exactly the same. You're just assuming that your beta is positive and you're doing uh, dynamics on the positive uh, vectors. So when you are doing the gradient flow and you initialize your gradient flow, at the scale alpha, okay, what you can show is that your algorithm will be biased through a particular geometry defined by a function R of alpha, okay, the function will be parameterized by your initialization, initialization scale. And what is very important to uh, have in mind is that for a large alpha, when your initialization is large, then the geometry will be close to the L2 uh, norm, it will be close to the Euclidean geometry. But when the initialization will be small, when alpha will be small, then your geometry will be close to the L1 geometry. Okay? So if you are starting from a point with the large initialization, then it will be implicitly biased through the L2 norm. But if you are starting from a point with a small initialization, then you will be implicitly biased through the L1 norm. And in the case that you have a sparse prior on your data, it will be particularly nice to have this um, L1 re and implicit regularization. So that's called gradient descent. And then the question, you know, it's what about the stochasticity induced by stochastic gradient descent? So what is happening now if you are still minimizing this non-convex function, but not with gradient descent, but with stochastic gradient descent. And to do that, we will not consider exactly stochastic gradient descent, but we will consider one particular uh, model uh, of this dynamic for small, I mean, which can be considered as a limit when the steps are this small. And you see that even, you know, so the main question would be, Will the noise change the implicit bias? Will the noise change the implicit regularization of the problem? And empirically, you directly see that if you plot the generalization performance when I have assumed like a sparse uh, prior, and I compare the generalization performance of gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, and two different runs of stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so here I took kind of two extremes. You really see that uh, the generalization performance of HD is uh, far better. Whereas the loss is still going to zero, but you also see that the loss of HD is going slower to zero. And so this is what we would try to understand in the last uh, four minutes we have today. But so first, what we have to do is to define, uh, you know, the stochastic gradient flow, because as I told you, even in the deterministic case, it's kind of difficult to characterize implicit bias of the discretized algorithm and descent. So we refer, I mean, we are using some uh, continuous uh, small step size uh, approximation. And so if you rewrite, you know, your uh, stochastic and descent algorithm, where you put uh, the noise C i t of the model in a particular form, then in fact, you can see that you can model this algorithm with this particular uh, stochastic flow, this particular stochastic differential equation. So it will really be your normal uh, gradient flow plus a particular noise term, which will depend on uh, Brownian motion. But you see that the covariance of this noise term is super important. And so in fact, it's really like the covariance which will help you to exactly match the covariance of 
the original stochastic distant algorithm that's the first part. And you also see that the noise term belong to this uh, particular space, W multiplied by the span of the observation. So kind of you keep the same structure between the both algorithm, and that's really important. Because all our result will be for this exact model of LGD, and will not all for different uh, stochastic model. And empirically, you really see that if you compare, if you, you know, discretize this dynamic with a very small step size, it will behave in a similar manner as a stochastic agent descent. And another important point is that you see that the step size is still present in this stochastic model. Okay, and what we were able to show uh, for this stochastic model is that if I, you know, let me remind you that for gradient descent, we were biased through this geometry induced by the function R of alpha. For stochastic gradient descent, it's possible to show that with high probability, the iterates will converge to a zero training error, okay? It will converge in the calculator. And the limit, beta alpha, will still be biased through this geometry induced by the function R of alpha. But it could not be the alpha of the initialization, it would be an alpha effective, okay, alpha infinity, with an uh, explicit formula for this formula for this alpha infinity. So alpha infinity will be equal to alpha times a const I mean times a, a number, which will be a stochastic number because it will depend on the integral of the loss along the iterand. And you see that this you know term will always be. Uh, smaller than one. So the alpha effective you are uh, enjoying with gradient descent, with stochastic gradient descent, is always better than the alpha you have with gradient descent. Okay, and it's also possible to get more quantitative. But the idea is really that, you know, using gradient descent, I mean, using noise, then stochastic gradient descent will uh, behave as gradient descent started from a smaller initialization. And also what is important to have in mind is that it's not, you know, it's not free lunch. The smaller your initialization is, the slower you are converging to the solution. So you are improving your generalization property, but you are degrading your conversion speed. So I won't have time to talk about the label noise result, but I can just show you, you know, quickly this kind of result where you see that when you compare gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, so the convergence and the train loss of stochastic gradient descent is slower, which means that the integral of the loss with uh, stochastic gradient descent is large. And so the implicit bias would be better for stochastic gradient descent than gradient descent. So what are the take home message of today's talk? The first one is really that it could be a nice idea to consider some uh, appropriate stochastic uh, uh, model of your optimization algorithm in order to uh, enlighten interesting and pertinent results. And the second mm -hmm. take home message is that for a specific uh, type problem, namely uh, sparse linear regression, then it's possible to probably show that the noise you know, can help you uh, to bias your dynamic toward um, well generalization uh, well generalizing the solution. Okay, thanks, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nicolas. That was very interesting. Very nice talk. We have time for some questions and I already see one over there. So let me just walk over. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, I have a question. So some authors pointed out that uh, the large step may be very important in uh, the performance of stochastic gradient descent. So I was wondering what uh, is, uh, what do you think is missing? So what will change in the picture if you include this, uh, this additional piece to the puzzle? Okay, that's a very nice question, and we, we have some uh, ongoing work on this. What is first important to keep in mind is that with our uh, stochastic model, 
you know, we still have this large step size. Okay. So you can have for different step size for SGD with different step size will correspond different uh, stochastic continuous equation. Okay. So the continuous dynamics, in some sense, when you have noise, still model the large step size. That's the first point, which is important to have in mind, and which is different from the gradient flow, which totally neglect the small size. In fact, if you are taking you know, the step size to zero, then the limit of LGT would be the gradient flow. So in order to still get some noise, you have to consider large step size. And then, just to give you an intuition, okay, so we say that the implicit bias is better when alpha uh, effective is small. In order to have alpha infective small, you need to have this term as large as possible. And you see that this term in some sense depends on the step size. So having a large step size is important in order to, you know, to increase the uh, sparse effect for your intention. So step, I mean, large step size is totally present in the pictures. But it, it's possible to be more quantitative, and we are currently working on this. OK, thank you. Is that OK for you? I have another question right here. Hi, I was wondering, do you have an explicit expression for this uh, function capital R? How does it depend on this parameter alpha? Yeah, yeah, you have a close form for uh, R. I mean, you can look at it in, the, in our paper or in Natty's paper. It's, uh, in that case, it would be easy to depend on some log. I mean, it's a close form function. You can plot, you, you know everything. Which will depend on uh, on alpha and on uh, your parameter. Uh, and you, in your asymptotic expression, when when you take a limit of alpha, it it converts to some norm. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it does not convert to some norm, but it will be equivalent to some uh, to some norm. So in some sense, when you are looking at this problem for super large alpha, it will be equivalent to the problem of minimizing the two norm of your parameter under interpolation condition. And when you are looking at this problem for super small alpha, it would be equivalent to minimize the one norm under the interpolation condition. Okay. okay. And, and I mean, this is really, I mean, it's not difficult. Uh, I, I didn't put the formula of R, but it's, you know, there is no, nothing in the middle. It's one function you exactly know, an analytical function of uh, everything. Okay, so but like log, uh, I forgot, like, uh, hyperbolic sinus or stuff like this. Okay. And we have time for one last question, so I'm just going to okay, walk around. Thank you, Nicola. Um, actually, I just have a question regarding this diagonal network. So I understand it has some nice properties because you have some tractable closed form solutions, but do you have any intuition if there could exist another simple model where you could have um, some kind of implicit bias as well? I mean, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, for me, that's the only only simple model where you have like an explicit characterization of the implicit bias. Otherwise, you will have some characterization of the implicit bias only for, you know, if you take the initialization to zero, or if you take the initialization to infinity, or if you are considering a classification problem. Because in some sense, classification problem uh, without regularization, your iterate will diverge to infinity, so you will always escape this uh, kind of scale of initialization. So classification is less difficult, but for regression, uh, for now that the only kind of a problem for which we have uh, as precise characterization, and the reason is because in fact, I mean, I haven't time to talk about it today, but underlying all this mechanism, you have some mirror distance structure, okay? And the implicit bias of the mirror distance is perfectly understood. And in fact, because the key idea is that when I'm doing gradient flow on this U and V, it's equivalent to do a mirror descent or a mirror flow on beta, and then the geometry will be given by the potential of the mirror descent. And 
for now that the only problem is this small diagonal neural network. I mean, you can add multiple layers, but they are still diagonal for which we have this mirror business structure. So even if you are considering like fully connected network, like it could be like U times a matrix V, you won't get such a characterization. But that's a very good question. Yes, it was. Um, okay, I think we have to move on to the next speaker. So, Nicola, yeah, we hope that you will come Recording to the next stopped. at some point in the future. But for now, let's just thank you again for your talk and your questions.